Hello and welcome to the Sunday service for the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. Our congregation reflects an area along the Florida Panhandle and the Alabama Gulf Coast and in today's world from anywhere that you choose to join us. Welcome. I am Reverend Alice Silty, and it is my honor and pleasure to serve this congregation as minister, a congregation whose mission is to celebrate diversity, strive for justice, and inspire love. If you would like to learn more about our congregation, please feel free to reach out. I would love to talk with you. It's good to be together today. Our chalice lighting words today come from Albert Schweitzer. At times our light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. Yeah. 
Apart But Together by Cynthia Landrum Spirit of life and love, we gather together in different ways this morning. From computer screens, from telephones, from car radios, we gather reaching out across the wires, waving from a safe distance. To come together in religious community, from living room to front porch to car seat, we gather as we are able, ready to be of service to each other, to the world, ready to build a community of hope and of love. We face this bright morning. We are apart, but we are together, offering our love, our commitment, our hopes, and our prayers in service to one another and this world. It is a new way, but an old way, and we come together in worship today. Please join me in the words to our church covenant. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Our candles represent the many joys and sorrows within our beloved community. And one candle burns always for all the joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts, yet unspoken. I see a lot of female colleagues or um, past veterans, uh, veterans who actually do are recognized um, either for their work, the work that they've done uh, when they were on active duty, and some are still on active duty, and so they're they're still recognized. I don't know that I'm the one to figure, but they are certainly my colleagues certainly um, have been recognized for their work as veterans. It shaped me in so many ways in terms of discipline and looking beyond the current situation and having the persistence and the grit to move forward regardless of the challenge that you're being faced with. So um, you learn how to work with people from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life. And you understand the challenges that they face because their walk wasn't your walk. And so um, your response to them may be different, but it is a it was a great foundation um, for who I have become in my adult life. Patrice Moore 
and I was in the United States Navy as a hospital corpsman from June 1994 to June 2001. I think again it's different because nobody realizes we're veterans. Nobody thinks that we did anything that I had a friend that said, oh, you would, had it easy. You were in the military. Yeah, I didn't see you uh, in the field. And it, yeah, people don't realize we do the same things that men do. We go to the field, we fire weapons, we crawl under barbed wire, we get in the mud, we do all that. People are the most important at the end of the day. My name is Louisa Buford DeJarnett. I started in January 1976 and was medically retired in the June of 1985. I grew up because I was the baby in the family and so when I got in I had to grow up fast and I did. Beatrice Billis and I was in the, the WAC, actually the Army Air Corps because they didn't have a force then and I went in in the end of 1943 and I was in for three years, and then I came home. For a church to exist, it must have people that care that it exists. It must have people that support the work of the church through their generous giving of time and talent and treasure. The church is the community of ourselves. Its energy and its resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. So as we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within this community. We will now hear music from Denise D'Angelo while we have the opportunity to text and give. In this season of giving, it is a tradition of the church to take up a collection for the church staff, not the minister, but the other church staff. And so I'm sharing with you now information for how to contribute to that fund. I am of the generation that grew up playing Oregon Trail on our early computers, in which the pioneer family was required to traverse some difficult and dangerous terrain, hunting our own food and risking illness and death. Several times along the way, you would be required to cross a river which was full of potential hazards. Snakes, waterborne illness and infection, and of course drowning if the water was too high or turbulent. A generation or two of computer game players learned about the real dangers of crossing a river or a creek, the risks you choose to take 
to continue on, and the extent to which you are not in control of the outcome. And yet, as a child, when I went on hikes with my family out in the real world of nature, I always found crossing a creek to be the most exhilarating part of the whole hike. Some people think crossing a creek is easy, but I say this. All crossings are hard, whether creeks, mountains, or into other lives, says this morning's poet, Martha Courtauld. People have been crossing creeks for generations, sometimes for recreation, but often to stay alive. I think of immigrants today crossing the desert and the Rio Grande River to come to America. I think of enslaved Africans in the 1800s who, after escaping bondage, found shelter and safety in what was called the Great Dismal Swamp a thousand square mile area of forested peat bog along the border of Virginia and North Carolina. The dense vegetation and the difficulty of navigating the swampy waters made it the perfect hiding place from those seeking to bring them back to slavery. As they continued to follow the Underground Railroad, they crossed the Ohio River, which was the de facto border between slavery and freedom. I think of the biblical story of the Israelites in the ancient Middle East who crossed the Red Sea with the help of their God, escaping slavery in Egypt. The creek can also, of course, be less literal. I feel like I am in a creek crossing time of life right now, with the waters of a pandemic swirling around me and dangerous snakes just outside of my vision trying to navigate changes and decisions in life and family and ministry. I am crossing one step at a time, discerning my direction as I go, not knowing what's on the other side. The not knowing scares me sometimes, but at other times fills me with hope about the creative possibilities present in that open-endedness. Crossing creeks is what we are asked to do our whole lives, as change is inevitable. So what creek are you crossing, or perhaps about to cross, in your life? It could be a time of uncertainty, a change of life stage or a coming of age, a time of crisis, a crossing into another life, like the enslaved Africans did as they crossed from enslaved to free, a period of wandering in the wilderness like the Israelites in the desert. It could be a crossing brought about by changing relationships, a death, a marriage, a birth, a divorce, a new love. There's a Sufi Muslim parable about a journeying stream who from its course in far off mountains, passing through every kind and description of countryside, at last reached the sands of the desert. Just as it had crossed every other barrier, the stream tried to cross this one, but found that as fast as it ran into the sand, its waters disappeared. It was convinced, however, that its destiny was to cross the desert, and yet there was no way. Then, a hidden voice coming from the desert itself whispered, the wind crosses the desert, and so can the stream. The stream objected that it was dashing itself against the sand and only getting absorbed, that the wind could fly, and this was why it could cross the desert. The voice said, by hurtling in your own accustomed way, you cannot get across. You will either disappear or become a marsh. You must allow the wind to carry you over to your destination. But how could this happen? By allowing yourself to be absorbed by the wind, the voice said. This idea was not acceptable to the stream. After all, it had never been absorbed before. It did not want to lose its individuality. And once having lost it, how was one to know that it could ever be regained? The wind, said the sand, performs this function. It takes up water, carries it over the desert, and then lets it fall again 
falling as rain, the water again becomes a river. Well, how can I know that this is true, said the stream. It is so, said the desert, and if you do not believe it, you cannot become more than a quagmire, and even that could take many, many years, and it certainly is not the same as a stream. But can I not remain the same stream that I am today? You cannot in either case remain so, the whisper said. Your essential part is carried away and forms a stream again. You are called what you are even today because you do not know which part of you is the essential one. When the stream heard this, certain echoes began to arise in the thoughts of the stream. Dimly, it remembered a state in which it, or some part of it, had been held in the arms of the wind. It also remembered, or did it, that this was the real thing and not necessarily the obvious thing to do. And the stream raised its vapor into the welcoming arms of the wind, which gently and easily bore it upwards and along letting it fall softly as soon as they reached the roof of a mountain many, many miles away. And because it had its doubts, the stream was able to remember and record more strongly in its mind the details of the experience. It reflected, yes, now I have learned my true identity. This journeying stream could have learned from Martha Courtois' poetic wisdom. Whether it's a person crossing a creek, or a creek crossing a desert, or a community crossing into a new life, what does it require? Courteau says that crossing a creek requires three things. Serenity of mind, bare feet, and a sure trust. This first one was puzzling to some of you who joined me at the Monday night poetry class. And honestly, it eluded me until I came across the Sufi parable of the journeying stream, and then it made so much more sense. Crossing a creek requires serenity of mind. The stream kept dashing itself against the sands in the desert and getting nowhere. The stream learned from the voice of the sand that it must allow itself to be absorbed by the wind and carried across by the wind. Crossing a creek with serenity of mind means being at peace and not trying to fight the current and accepting that we are not in control. Experienced mountaineers know this well. Don't fight the current and don't try to plow straight across. Instead, move with the current and with each step, move diagonally downstream as you make your way across. Crossing the creek with serenity of mind means allowing ourselves to be absorbed, not to lose ourselves, but to join with what will carry us across. We may be carried across by the wind, or by God, or by spirit, or by the power of courage and faith. I chuckled when I came to the part of the parable that says, this idea was not acceptable to the stream. After all, it had never been absorbed before. It did not want to lose its individuality. There are many fiercely independent people among us who feel similarly. It requires relinquishing control and reliance on the grace of whatever carries us across. Second, crossing a creek requires bare feet. But why take your shoes off, especially if they are high quality, aggressive tread hiking boots made of materials meant to protect you from any number of hazards? Because we walk differently when we have bare feet. We walk carefully so as not to step on something sharp or something like a snake that will bite us. We pay attention and we feel things that we cannot feel with shoes on. Sometimes having bare feet helps us to be more sure-footed on the often slippery rocks and logs that help us across. Crossing a creek with bare feet also feels very vulnerable. No matter how careful we are, no matter how much we are aware or not aware, believe or don't believe in the snakes that lie just beyond our vision, 
crossing a creek with bare feet is risky. But crossing a creek in, of any kind in our lives requires both vulnerability and groundedness. That is a stability and a connection to where and who you are. Third, crossing a creek requires a sure trust that the snake we know slides silently underwater just beyond our vision will choose to ignore the flesh that cuts through its territory and we will pass through. The neighborhood where I live in East Dallas has creek beds winding throughout. I can walk a block or less in any direction and find myself at a big ravine which has a little or a lot of water running through it depending on the season. There's so much beauty in these creek beds and in the green belts that border them. They are full of fossils and interesting plants. They also have their fair share of trash, as well as wildlife like armadillos, turtles, birds, bobcats, coyotes, and yes, snakes. Sometimes when I peer down into the creek bed, I don't see any of these potentially dangerous animals, but I know that like the poet says, they are just beyond my vision. In any crossing in our lives, whether literal or figurative, there are those snakes at our feet just out of our vision. The poet says we must believe in the snakes themselves and not downplay or deny the danger. We cannot see them to believe in them but we must believe nonetheless. Now this kind of belief or faith in something we cannot see is hard for many Unitarian Universalists who are rational people, who believe in science, who require evidence for what we embrace as true. If this is you, you are not alone. The journeying stream in the Sufi story has the same struggle. When it hears from the sand that the wind will take it up will take up its waters and carry them over the desert and then release them as rain to once again become a river. The stream asks, how can I know that this is true? But then, dimly, it remembered a state in which it had been held in the arms of the wind and that this was a real thing and that it was possible, even if not necessarily the obvious thing to do. The poet says that in crossing a creek, we must believe and have a sure faith and trust that we will make it through unbidden. In fact, we don't just believe, but we must practice believing. It's kind of like the belief, faith, and trust version of fake it until you make it. You tell yourself, I can do this. I can make it through. This is possible. And this gives you the courage that you need to make it across. This poem reflects both the possible danger and the necessary trust required of the many crossings in our lives. What often comes of this journey is a discovery or a deeper understanding of who we really are. The stream discovers its true identity as something more essential than a flowing stream. The Israelites, having crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land, can say, I am home. The enslaved Africans, having crossed, can say, I am free. The immigrant, having crossed, can say, I have a future and places to go. America, having crossed this tumultuous time in our history, can say, we have crossed this creek before, and we can do it again. Any of us having crossed, can say, I am courageous, and I am a person of faith. In a way, we are all crossing this time in history together, separated from one another, but certainly not alone. In a recent conversation with a church member, they said, I am happy to have an anchor in the church. In the best of crossing situations, we have something to hold on to, a rock or an anchor of some kind to prevent us from being swept away. In the best of situations, but not always. For this current creek crossing though, we do have our church community and our Unitarian Universalist faith as that anchor. 
Our church's founding sermon by Daniel Limbaugh talked about this church as providing a chart and compass for the spiritual life. But now we find ourselves in uncharted territory, so what do we do? The church still offers a moral and spiritual compass, but in these times, it also serves as an anchor to ground us. So the next time you encounter a crossing in your life, a mountain, a creek, a crossing from one life to another, how will you approach it? And how will you make your way across? Will you stay safely on the shore and enjoy the beauty of it? Will you try to rush across to whatever is next? Or will you wade across with serenity of mind, bare feet, and a sure trust. Your church community is with you. Let us all have the courage and faith it takes to cross, to feel held in love and grace as we go, and to discover new and deeper truth and meaning along the way. Amen. We are one by Amy Zucker Morgenstern. Never has it been more true than now. We extinguish this flame, but the sparks within us remain alight. For each of us in our supposed solitude, the signals buzz and hum, sparking through space, one to another, connecting us invisibly but palpably. We are one and from every window our light shines. share if we care. 